Welcome to the CMMC Proof Podcast. I'm your host, Darius Phillips, a certified CMMC assessor. Today, I have Will Drake joining me. He is a senior security analyst for the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research at Indiana University, IU. Right. I'm home of the Hoosiers. I'm originally from Indiana and yeah, definitely Indiana University is well known. <laughs> How are you, Will? Um, I'm doing pretty well. I'm just hanging there. It's a nice, nice day here. Um, you know, just hanging out, doing work, feeling good. Yeah, definitely got to cherish any nice days in <laughs> Indiana. <laughs> it's some yeah. crazy weather. <laughs> yeah, all over the place. Yeah, I remember I, I, I live in Dallas now, but I was when I first visited Dallas. It was like in early May, and I, I, I flew out of Chicago. It was a blizzard. <laughs> it was yeah. snow, like negative twelve in May. <laughs> I arrived in Dallas. It was in the uh, like, not eighties already. So okay, I like this a lot better. Are, are you from Indiana? Yeah, Richmond? born and raised in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, okay, grew okay. up around the university, and eventually started working there. All right, nice. Cool. Great. Well, Will, can you, um, as far as your role as a senior security analyst, can you tell us more about it? What do you do? What's your day to day? What does it look like? Sure. So it's kind of all over the place. Um, <laughs> so I've got I've got actually two titles. I'm uh, aside from being a senior security analyst, I'm also the chief information security office for our research center. And it's pretty typical at uh, CACR, Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Uh, people wear a lot of different hats because we've got a lot of different active projects we're going on and people kind of get sprinkled a lot, uh, sprinkled amongst multiple projects. So one of my primary projects is uh, Secure My Research, um, and I'm mm -hmm. kind of uh, the lead on that. And that's a service where we provide cybersecurity and compliance consulting, uh, really focused on just like helping researchers understand best practices and accelerating their research. So that's just one thing. Okay. I also do some uh, cybersecurity consulting um, to a lot of external parties. That's what CACR kind of specializes in. Uh, we've got a lot of projects like Trusted CI, the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, where we're providing consulting to NSF funded research facilities, do some like more lightweight uh, consulting for individual research organizations, depending on what they need. Sometimes that's compliance stuff, like getting them ready for a FISMA assessment, that kind of thing. Uh, so my day-to-day -day is just kind of all over the place. A lot of times researchers <laughs> or research organizations are reaching out to me. Uh, a lot of times it's, we've got this problem, help us solve it, or it's an ongoing engagement to help them okay. stand up a cybersecurity program and get going. All right, so I'm sure it's never a dull moment. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what type of research does it takes place at IU? I'm sure you have a wide variety, but are y'all specializing in type of research? Yeah, it, it's a wide variety. We are an R1 school, so you know a significant amount of research funding that's coming in. I think our, if I remember correctly, our two biggest uh, you know funding organizations that we're working with that we're getting uh, funding from are the NSF um, okay. and NIH. So a lot of just you know, general scientific research and health focused research. I know there are, um, you know, there are some projects getting funding from DOD and various subcontractors under them. Um, so okay. there's a, a bit of that going on. Uh, the last time we were kind of helping out with some of that, uh, you know, uh, DFARS or for CMMC adjacent type stuff, there weren't a lot. There were a, a handful of those types of projects, but like I said, the majority is NIH and NSF funded research that's happening at IU. Awesome. You mentioned uh, one of the hats you wear and just kind of focus is helping the researchers understand cybersecurity best practices. What are some of the challenges that you encounter when trying to help do that? One of the just general challenges is just, and we talk about it a lot in that white paper. I mentioned that, uh, so mm -hmm. Secure My Research is really one of my biggest uh, projects that I'm working on. And we have a white paper out it's called Effective Cybersecurity Research. And it's all about kind of breaking that mentality that researchers have gained over the years, that mm -hmm. cybersecurity exists just to kind of slow them down. <laughs> so that, I would say that was initially definitely the biggest challenge is mm -hmm. we were spinning up a service where we wanted to use cybersecurity specifically as a force to accelerate research at IU mm -hmm. rather than impose restrictions. So the goal and mission of Secure My Research is uh, accelerate research at IU while reducing risk to the research mission. Mm -hmm. So 
that was the service we spun up. And there was some initial challenges going in there, speaking to researchers and like breaking that thought of, you know, researchers saying, yeah. are, we, are we the police coming in to like try and find yeah. something to get them in trouble? Um, it's deeply ingrained. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And really, once we broke that impasse, that challenge has by now almost completely gone away. So I would wow. say some of the biggest challenges now are just um, just the wide range of needs and challenges that face univer uh, researchers at such a broad uh, university. And then working mm -hmm. with the institution to find out, uh, you know, can we solve this problem? Do we need to take this problem to the right people and then actually mm -hmm. get them to take action on it? Because that's one of the biggest things we do as part of Secure My Research, aside from engaging with individual researchers, is advocacy on, on, on the part of our researchers where we're trying to find things at IU that are slowing research down, taking that mm -hmm. to the right stakeholder and saying, hey, look, this is the problem. Let's work together to fix it so our researchers can get going faster. So yeah, I would say just being able to handle that very wide range of challenges <laughs> and knowing who to take that to and the right steps is probably one of the bigger challenges, but we've been doing pretty well at it so far. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. It's, you said something, two things that normally don't go together. Normally I don't hear as far as um, speeding up the research while reducing risks. <laughs> that is yep. something where I'm sure you have some puzzled looks where people are like, yeah, yeah. really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, that was, again, that was like the design principle. When we went into de designing Secure My Research, it's focusing on accelerating the mission while simultaneously reducing risk. And what we found is that by using cybersecurity to accelerate research, it inherently reduced risks. Kind of a day to day on Secure My Research. We get researchers that come to us, they'll send us an email, say, This is the type of research project I've got. And then they'll either have a specific question, like, I've got to go out in the field and collect data from individuals. Mm -hmm. Or they'll come to us and say, This is the type of research I'm doing. Um, can you help me understand the best way to get this done? And we right. come to them, we don't spend any time at all talking about cybersecurity specifically. Mm -hmm. We say, okay. all right, tell us about your, your research. Tell us about who your collaborators are. Tell us about who your research participants are. Tell us about how your data needs to flow, what you need to produce at the end of this. And we give mm -hmm. them an end-to-end -end workflow that just happens to have the security built into it. So they don't have to take extra steps to be secure. We've already taken care of that for them. We see ourselves as the cybersecurity professionals giving them cybersecurity rather than expecting it from them. So the researchers then aren't left trying to make those cybersecurity decisions mm -hmm. as, you know, untrained cybersecurity professionals. They're researchers. They're trying to get research right. done. Exactly. <laughs> also trying to be making cybersecurity decisions, accelerating research in that fashion, specifically giving them things that are pre-secured, not expecting more of them. And it's making it so these researchers aren't having mm -hmm. to go out and make uh, these cybersecurity decisions and introduce more risk to the institution that way. We're giving them right. clean, secured solutions that are faster than if they tried to figure it out on their own, thus reducing risk to the institution almost innately. Wow, that is impressive. <laughs> I must yeah. admit, certainly a model that can be used in any organization because it kind of flies in the face of traditional cybersecurity and compliance where it's so burdensome and right. just just overwhelming but i love the fact you say okay we we start with the what what do you need the researcher and then we present them what the solution that just happens to have cybersecurity built in right. wow that that is a, a great takeaway you can drop the mic now and yeah. just, <laughs> yeah, that, was, that is yeah. really good awesome yeah and it, and it works out really well to just say here's the fastest way to get this done and they don't know mm -hmm. on the back end the security is already baked in it's just they're yeah. looking for the fastest way it's already secured they're up and running it just happens to be the fastest way is the secure way and vice versa. The secure way happens to be the fastest way and they're off and running, doing it the right way without even knowing it. <laughs> you gotta love it. Yeah. It reminds me of trying to give my kids medicine, like <laughs> mix it in with their favorite drink or some candy or something. <laughs> yeah, you don't even know what's and, and, and don't know it, but yeah. that's pretty cool. Wow. I'll certainly link to the, the white paper that you mentioned for secure my research. How long has secure my research been operational? Yeah. So as far as operational, we launched it, uh, we started developing it in 2019. That's when I joined uh, the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research and then planned on launching it going into the spring semester of 2020. That's when our campus shut down due to coronavirus. 
Um, yeah. So we were like, we should hold on to this for a little bit. So we launched it essentially the beginning of the fall semester of 2020. Uh, and we've since then been able to show, uh, you know, very successful results. That's great. Like you mentioned, the researchers, they're not cybersecurity professionals. So just handing them a security questionnaire or requirements and expecting them to know what to do, right. it's just going to leave everyone frustrated and potentially introduce more risks. Exactly. Like, like, yeah. like that you're all aiming, hey, we're going to present you the, the, the fastest, most streamlined, secure solution. Everyone's happy with that. Like you can't, yeah. <laughs> can't complain when it, when it comes to that. So, wow, yeah, really like that a lot. Now, in terms of what are some common security requirements you all see coming in that's embedded in the grants and contracts for the research phase? Yeah, so that that varies quite a bit. A lot yeah. of times you'll see funding uh, agencies or just, you know, individual uh, funding, like a company that's just wanting to fund some kind of research. A lot of times cybersecurity is, uh, you know, not in there at all, besides just saying appropriately secure this data. And then right, it's kind really of vague. Like, yeah, really <laughs> right, vague. Right, well. the, the next level above that are these individual funding agencies that um, list out like a specific requirement. Typically it's looking at uh, ensuring that uh, access res is restricted, mm -hmm. that data is properly secured. Usually you see those things like uh, encryption in transit, encryption at rest. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff, uh, you'll see things like uh, restrictions on publication, specifically what data can be in there, just those very basic cybersecurity controls. And then right. you get a step above that where, um, you know, you've got like the NIH or something like that, um, or, a, you know, a data provider that will specifically invoke a compliance regime like HIPAA. And so now you've got mm. uh, a bit more to worry about. And then, of course, with DOD, you know, started off with some of those, uh, the DFAR 7012 clause. Right. Uh, eventually, you know, we started seeing more of the ones, I can't remember the exact number, uh, 7019, I think it is, where you have to, yeah. you know, do a self-assessment, yeah. upload a SPURS score. Right. Yep. So uh, quite a range from very general <laughs> to very specific. Yep. Yeah. And there's more coming every day. <laughs> yeah, and of course, with the, with the NSPM 33 stuff. Of course, oh, yeah. IU is well over that that fifty million dollar threshold for of federal funding. Um, so that's when uh, you know you've got to have an institutional cybersecurity program for your research. Right. In order to provide the secure solutions, where once the researcher tell you what they need, do you all kind of already have solutions architected? Where you have in mind what kind of most plug and play, or how in that process? Yeah, that was basically a prerequisite. A lot of the work that led up to uh, Secure My Research and really enabled its success. So in the white paper, it kind of talks about the history of it. Um, it was Secure My Research was the, essentially the brainchild of Dr. Anurag Shankar, my manager. Um, mm -hmm. He was, uh, you know, in our IU's research technologies division. And back in the early 20s, as, uh, you know, HIPAA was coming into force, IU got some large grants um, from Eli Lilly, you know, like a medical devices and uh, mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals provider. And, you know, with this money, these uh, researchers needed high performance computing resources. So the, the resources were built, uh, these high performance computers. And then my manager, as part of the research technologies uh, division, went to these researchers in our school of health and our school of medicine. And we're like, hey, we've got these fancy supercomputers. They're ready for you to start using for these big research grants we've got. <laughs> and they were like, well, hold on, wait a second. This HIPAA thing just came out. Are these systems HIPAA compliant? And mm. at that time, my manager didn't know what that meant. So he had to go <laughs> back and learn about it. Um, and what that led to eventually is uh, he created like a, a HIPAA compliance program within our research technologies division took some of our big new high, perform uh, high performance computing resources and high performance storage solutions through that HIPAA compliance process, um, mm -hmm. and then was able to go back to those researchers and say, now, now they're compliant and ready to go. But even with that compliance, you know, he was able to go there and say, you know, these things perform at, you know, gigaflops and teraflops and using all this verbiage that these researchers really didn't understand. It wasn't yeah. until Anurag and a person who worked under him at that time switched up how they were talking about it, uh, saying, yeah. we've got these resources. They would show up at a researcher's lab. That researcher mm -hmm. would walk around and say, these are all the different things I'm doing, because that's what they would show up at a lab and just say, show us what you're doing. The right. researcher would spend their time you know, talking about all these things, and then they would key in on specific things. They would say, so Anurag and the person that worked under him, Andy, would key in and say, that 
we can make that part of your workflow right there 10 times faster mm -hmm. by just using this resource. Just yeah, that gets their one. attention. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's how things started. And that ended up being such a successful way to do it that over time, every single system in our research technologies division, from data management uh, systems like REDCap, multiple high-performance computing servers, multiple research storage servers, mm -hmm. like research survey tools, data archival tools, all of them went through this. It started as a HIPAA process and over time became a NIST risk RMF, risk management mm -hmm. framework process. Okay. Every single, our, single one of our research systems goes through that. And then mm -hmm. also individual uh, systems that are just managed by our central IT department, like a fax. Fax is still heavily used both by healthcare and by healthcare researchers. So right. that we're like, this would benefit researchers to go through this process as well. Over time, we were able to build up this huge catalog of centrally managed systems that we were able to take through our risk management framework. And so now that's how we can sit with our researchers. They tell us what they need. We map right. their needs to a specific system and then give them an end to end workflow. Like, how are you collecting the data? Okay. When you collect the data, let's use this secure share platform to bring the data in. And then once right. you analyze that data, let's put it on this supercomputer with this storage solution. And then, right. you know, once you need to publish, you know, extract these data elements uh, that your funder has can call sensitive, and then you can right. publish it over here at this system that's managed uh, for publications by our libraries. That catalog was uh, what was a key in us being able to provide a full end-to-end -end solution for our researchers. Yeah, that's the secret sauce. Yep, having solutions yeah. ready to go is the secret sauce. Yep. It's, it's crazy that in 2024, that's still a, a revolutionary concept <laughs> right. where so yep. many organizations just continue to reinvent the wheel, start over from scratch, and not think about streamlining this and have ready to go compliant solutions. Right. Yeah, and that's okay. where, if, if there's something needed beyond that, say a researcher comes to us with a truly novel research use case we've never seen before, and nothing quite matches that we'll go to our solutions, like our secure storage location, which is one of them is in Teams, and we'll see if we can mess with it to, to work just the right way for that researcher. So we'll we'll kind of exhaust our options, tweak mm -hmm. these systems to, to try and get them to work exactly how we want them to. If that doesn't work, we'll go to, like I said before, we'll go to the right team, either in research technologies or like a large research support center, and mm -hmm. we'll help them understand this big need for it, uh, we'll help them, you know, stand up a solution, take it through the, the NIST RMF if needed, take it through the institutional approval processes and get it ready to go. So that's kind of a, a, a glimpse into our advocacy that we do for researchers when we can't identify a solution that's already in place. Oh, yeah, I can see why the, the researchers would be happy with y'all. You'd be their yeah. favorite people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, I don't want to deal with that security stuff. Just tell me what, what yep. solution you have. <laughs> exactly. Yep. It, it reminds me almost like cloud service providers, where if you need a solution, you can just go Google it or type on their website and it'll tell you, okay, all right, you need an S3 bucket or you need this solution, whatever, where you don't have, I don't have to know the details or anything. Exactly. It's just, yeah. 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 They, they've spent a lot of times. I feel that's why, especially the big three are so successful. They listen mm -hmm. to their customers, every single edge case that their customers needed, right. they made sure there was a solution for it. And it was easy to find. Um, yep. and then they'll send, you know, if you're, if you're an institution or something like that, they'll send, you know, a solutions expert to you who sits yeah. down, understands what you need and says, these are the systems you enable, and this is how you do it. And then you're mm -hmm. up and going. Yeah. Yeah. It is an awesome model. Um, yeah. And also you mentioned with the advocacy, I like in terms of the, the verbiage y'all use with the researchers, make sure you eliminate all the tech jargon and speak right. to them in terms they understand how can you make their life easier? <laughs> That's universal language. You, you're going to yeah. improve my business processes. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to listen versus you get into all the tech jargon and the details and the compliance acronyms. Yeah. Right. We let us understand that and we'll just give you the parts you need to know as a researcher. Exactly. Love it. What are some other creative approaches you're all taking to the advocacy? With it, it, there, there's a big range there as well. Um, I can give one example. There was a, um, a researcher that needed uh, to do video diaries uh, where mm. a participant could log in and um, just record uh, how they were feeling that day and that kind of stuff and drop it off in a way that they couldn't see it again. 
because the researcher didn't want a participant going back, watching an old video, influencing how they talked the next time. So they wanted mm. participants to be able to just log in, create a video recording, and then never be able to touch it again. Oof, never be able to see it. Yeah. yeah. So that's where, like, in Teams, we found a specific way to create multiple teams. There's a setting to enable recording as soon as any participant joins. The participant could log in. As soon as the meeting started, it started recording. When they left that meeting, it you know, boxed up that recording into a file. Mm -hmm. The participant wasn't a member of the team, so they wouldn't be able to go in and watch the recording. So it's, oh. it's, it's that's just an example. Another one uh, was a researcher that came to us. This also in, illustrates a very important point. One of the things we do with our researchers is once we get our hooks in, once we get in and meet with them that first <laughs> time, yeah. we say, treat us like the security team on your, you know, of your research group. Like, you know, you didn't have a security team before you got one now right. and that's right. Um, and since we offer our services free of cost to, uh, to the entire research community at IU, they're more than willing to do that. <laughs> yeah. So a researcher had met with us when he first started his uh, project, which involved interviewing participants um, and then storing those interviews. And we gave him a solution for that. He came to us later and said, everything's working great as far as the storage, but I'm spending a lot of money and a lot of time having a graduate research assistants manually listen to these audio files and try and transcribe them by hand. Is there mm -hmm. anything else you can offer me? And that's where we went to, uh, IU at the time didn't have a solution for that other than attempting to like contract with an external entity. Right. Those things are a little bit scary because they're like ind independent contractors that yeah. receive mm -hmm. your audio file and can you know, listen to it in Starbucks and transcribe it there a lot of times. <laughs> Introducing risk yeah. that a researcher exactly. would consider. So what we did right. is we went to our social science research center and we said, hey, this is a need. Um, you know, here's uh, an example of how you can solve that with uh, the transcribe API in AWS. And mm -hmm. they took that, uh, worked with us and our research technologies division to turn that into an automated transcription platform that is now available to all researchers at IU for free. So mm -hmm. that's just another example of how we use our advocacy to, you know, break down barriers, find solutions. And now researchers don't have to send their data to these external people at all. There's an in-house right. tool available for that. And the data never has to leave IU. We've got, you know, our contracts with AWS that involve like a HIPAA business associate agreement. All that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. I like it a lot. Now, it sparks curiosity for me in terms of how you all train your team members, because traditionally, just my knowledge of working with cybersecurity professionals, generally speaking, they don't have that advocacy <laughs> bone right. in their body. Or you have to be intentional and train them to really think like that and be more proactive in terms of looking for solutions versus saying no. So, what approach do you all take for training and just creating that, fostering that culture for Secure My Research? Sure. Members. Yeah. Luckily, we've been able to get by doing this with a relatively small team, even though we work with a lot of researchers. For example, mm -hmm. one of our metrics is that we've got penetration into 90% of our academic departments and research centers at IU here. And we only essentially have two full-time employees working on this project. We've been lucky enough to be able to handle the workload with a relatively small team just because we can answer the questions quickly. Yeah. But a lot of how we train is broken down in that, that white paper. There's the, the fundamentals and the principles of being a research cybersecurity professional. Okay. Um, and a lot of it's really just about understanding uh, the researcher, the pressures on researchers, um, mm -hmm. and then just having those interpersonal skills. That's what we focus on. But the most recent person we hired into Secure My Research wasn't an IT guy. He wasn't mm -hmm. a cybersecurity guy at all. Yeah. He was uh, a researcher himself um, that worked in, uh, you know, did clinical trials and came in and with that research understanding and had done something like had built computers at home just as a hobby. So we can teach a smart and empathetic person cybersecurity, but it's hard yeah. to do that the other way around. So that, that's really what we focus on is finding those candidates that have those innate abilities to problem solve. Which I mean, researchers, that's that's the whole deal. So right. those innate problem solving and people skills is where we start. And then we just teach them cybersecurity on top of that. So that's a lot of that is IU specific knowledge, like here are the solutions we have. And then a lot of that's also like let's read and talk about HIPAA. 
uh, DFARS, all of this kind of stuff, like building on that cybersecurity stuff on top of a good solid foundation of problem solving and people skills. That's fantastic. And that's the word I was looking for, those interpersonal skills. A lot of right. IT technical people don't have those interpersonal skills. And that's so important because you have to be empathetic and really understand your your stakeholder that you're serving. So those, those principles you refer to with research, they apply to any organization, oh, any yeah. industry. That is really critical. And I, whenever I'm contacted by someone who says they want to maybe transition into cybersecurity, like I recently had a teacher contact me and she's like, I want to do cybersecurity, but I don't have an IT background. But I said, those teaching skills, you being yeah. able to talk to people and have those interpersonal skills, that's golden. <laughs> they, they, yeah. We need that in cybersecurity. So I love the fact that you all are thinking outside the box and not thinking, okay, you just got to have X number of years of IT experience to qualify for a cybersecurity role. So I think that's a big issue in our profession, but realizing that all those skills that, that cross over from other professions that can be used in cybersecurity. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's a really, really good point you made about a teacher wanting to cross over to cybersecurity. I feel that's why CACR in general has been successful at what we do. We take an interdisciplinary approach to cybersecurity. We've got lawyers uh, that work in CACR. Uh, you know, we've got researchers. We've got project managers. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got people from all different kinds of backgrounds. Like my manager, Anurag, um, who kind of you know started a lot of this stuff and has become well known in the compliance area for for yeah. education. Like he's got a PhD in astrophysics, so wow. it, it really is just having about that that variety of backgrounds uh, so that you can approach this very complex problem of cybersecurity from many different mindsets because that's truly what it takes. Yeah, yeah, he, he certainly is a, a rock star in the compliance the research space. His name comes up a lot on yeah. these yeah. interviews. That's how I met you. <laughs> so, certainly, wow, but I, I can see why this is my research concept. I'm taking notes. Yeah. I've been in cyber for 22 years. I've, I've learned some things. Like, oh, yeah. You all have a good, good um, approach to it. And I see why it's so popular. And another thing that I hope the listeners are taking notes on and understanding the reason you all can operate so efficiently and have such a large impact with a small team, you, you have those processes and systems in place and those ready solutions yeah. where you're not starting from scratch every time. Yeah, that is, that, that definitely increases the just output and efficiency yeah. of the team. Yeah. And we, we know our solutions well, we know our institution well. Another thing we do for our researchers, we serve as a single point of contact. Another big mm. risk in institutions is you've got all of these, uh, you know, siloed uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. If you're asking a researcher to do things the right way, follow policy, it'd be a huge ask just for them to understand which office is in charge of which process. Yeah. So we right. take care of that for them. And so we know our institution well, we know our processes well, we know our solutions well, and we also know research well. So that's where we don't have to spend a lot of time right. like saying, describe all of the individual steps your research has to do. We understand, you know, typically if it's uh, clinical research that they're bringing in participants, they, they're splitting them into different like control groups, applying different methodologies to the different groups and kind of how that analysis works. So, yeah, we just just know everything well and you can answer questions much quicker. And that's all about knowing research. Impressive. When I hear you talk about Secure My Research and just your all approach to advocating and assisting researchers, it makes me think of Amazon. They're so good at what they do because they reduce the friction. They make it yeah. really easy to buy something. <laughs> they, yeah. they eliminate all of the friction steps. So that sounds like, well, that's what you all are doing. You're reducing the friction. And when you think about cybersecurity and compliance, for, generally it's a lot of friction. But as a cybersecurity professional, we can yeah, remove a lot of those roadblocks and better serve our stakeholders. Yeah, exactly. Impressed. And it's hard to understand, like by reducing the friction, how large of a risk reduction that can have. Like I mentioned, in, almost entirely by word of mouth, our, you know, our services spread to capture 90% of our ac academic departments mm -hmm. and research centers. So looking at that one way, you can say, oh, yeah, we've helped a lot of people. Looking at from a, like a CISO's perspective, with the effort of two individuals, we've had risk reduction mm. in ninety percent of our institutions. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a Simply awesome re 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 investment there. Yeah. <laughs> so, certainly. Why do you think it is so challenging for universities to have that single point of contact for the research security, cybersecurity? Why is it so challenging for universities to adopt that similar model? Because it is so distributed typically. I think I think it just comes out of 
institutions, academic institutions have been around for so long. Like so yeah, many oh, we've always around, done like, it that way. <laughs> yeah, at, at least 200 years. And yeah, it's, it's the we've always done it that way. And it evolved this way out of necessity. So you've got all these different groups and like the work all these departments are doing is so varied and so unique to what they're doing. Things start to fragment and things start to make sense that they're fragmented. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of institutions, what they focus on is uh, let's make sure our office is doing our thing really well. Yeah. Rather than let's make sure that all these individual offices have like a seamless and streamlined process to get from one end to the other. It's, I don't know. I, I, it's just one of those things that like after it's in place, you think, why yeah. can we do it this way the whole time? Um, but leading up to that, it's just really challenging because again, people are focusing on what they're trying to do rather exactly. than everything all at once with how confusing being a researcher can be and with what your pressures are as a researcher, which is just getting your research done and getting published. I, I think people just don't really understand the level of confusion that can cause when you're just dropped in, trying to fight for funding, trying to get that research done in time to hit your tenure, right. where you don't have time to learn all these individual departments. So yeah, just providing that single source of contact is, I, I think people just don't quite understand how powerful it can be. Yeah. I'm glad you kind of outlined the, the stressors that researchers are under and a bit more so humanizes them and helps hopefully cybersecurity professionals understand once you throw cybersecurity on top of that, yep. <laughs> of course they're frustrated and just don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, that, it's just already too much. Like Henry Neiman at uh, University of Oklahoma gives a great presentation on this. He talks about uh, tenure track faculty. Typically faculty have seven years to get tenure or they're just bounced. Oh, wow. The researcher gets dropped in. They've got seven years, but actually it's six years because that whole last year is finding a new job if you know you're not going to get tenure. But actually it's five years because it takes a year <laughs> to get your you know journal article up and published. And then actually it's four and a half years because it takes all the time to do that data analysis and all that kind of stuff. So researchers hit the ground and, you know, Typically, their research itself takes one to five years, mm -hmm. and their timelines are incredibly short. And not only that, but they've got to fight for funding. It's not like you just drop in as a researcher and somebody's throwing money at you. You've got to fight <laughs> for that funding. You've got to compete for uh -huh. that funding. And on top of that, you're mentoring graduate students. You're trying to find good graduate students to bring in to help on your research. You're teaching a lot of times on top of all that. Cybersecurity just becomes, it's too much of an ask. So that's why it's got to be given to them rather than expected of them. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. That's a great um, way to look at it. There's a lot of good insight. And that's, again, going back to it's the core part of it is cybersecurity professionals. That's understanding who we're serving and understanding that cybersecurity is not their day job like it's ours. <laughs> they have a lot of other stressors and times and deadlines and things that they're dealing with while they're juggling. So you yep. can't just expect them to drop everything and also figure out cybersecurity. Yeah. That's, that's great. So I'm glad you all are, you all are taking L, that off their plate and yep. just make it streamlining it. Absolutely. Well, we know in the news, we've seen recently several universities that has been hit with false claims act in relation to like this SB 171, DFAR 7012. So we have Penn state, Georgia tech. What are your thoughts about just some of those cases i've i've certainly seen them like i okay. i knew this was a very likely outcome as soon as they added that that false claims act as an enforcement of the score mm -hmm. being reported to spurs especially when there was like the you know the whistleblower stuff that was added to that you know it's possible for somebody to report that the, the scores yeah. that were uh, reported were inaccurate um so i i expected it i will say i'm not not shocked by it I'm not sure I have too much deep insight to offer on, you know, why an institution would misreport. Again, I think it goes back to just, it's just such a challenge first off when you've got right. a research project that's coming in and their data can be going anywhere and everywhere, especially if you don't have these cybersecurity professionals that can sit with researchers and give them good guidance on where to put things. Okay. Um, and then, you know, on the individual system level, uh, there can just be so many pressures on people to just, you know, overinflate their scores. There may be even a okay. lack of understanding. A lot of institutions 
have cybersecurity professionals that aren't super well versed in compliance and understanding what a control means. And sometimes right. NIST isn't super great at providing a lot of support. You know, they've added the discussion section under the individual controls of NIST 800-171 and 853. But a lot of times, while verbose, those aren't super clear. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I, I think yeah. I think there's a lot of different things that could play into that, into why that's. I totally agree, and a big part of it, it can be have the best intent, but just don't understand the requirements. Right. It, it is confusing. <laughs> I know you mentioned again in the interview. I believe you said secure my research. You also serve or entities, organizations outside of IU. Is that correct? Yeah. So that's not specifically part of uh, secure my research. Primarily, mm -hmm. CACR is an external facing entity. We're just trying to find through through research uh, the best ways for organizations to approach the problem of cybersecurity. And so through that, organizations can approach us and you know say they want our help. That's one of the things that my team does is we're, mm -hmm. uh, we offer uh, a lot of compliance focused services to uh, external entities. Yeah. And what's the criteria for that? What type of entities? Uh, typically, uh, research entities. Uh, a lot of times, it, it's higher ed um, or just NSF-funded facilities. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's public sector research type stuff. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I would highly recommend those that qualify <laughs> reach out to y'all to get some of those those best practices. And yeah, y'all are doing something right over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you. Yeah. yeah. And we have for institutions around the U.S. Secure My Research, after we wrote that white paper, it's it's starting to spread. Multiple institutions have picked it up and, and just started using it, creating basically a clone of Secure My Research. Sometimes it's a bit more tailored to, to their specific institution. Uh, but there was even one case uh, for one institution where they came out and asked us, like, can you tell us what we could be doing better? And that's where mm -hmm. we took that white paper uh, turned it into an assessment methodology, and then provided a report, you know, to the research technologies team and their CISO about, you know, these are the challenges your researchers are facing. These are the gaps in your processes and policies. And this specifically is what's slowing your researchers down to the point that it's introducing unnecessary risk to your institution. So we've, we've done that as well for academic institutions, like a, a research security assessment. That's awesome. How does your team approach documenting like your internal processes, some of the best practices y'all follow? As far as documentation, the thing I would like to highlight the most is when we go and talk to our researchers, we say, you know, you have formed a relationship with us. We're part of your team now, and we want to be able to display that. And so that's why in the, in the beginning, we were just using a, a ticketing system. And that was pretty good. You know, and a person emails us. And we can respond to the ticket, handle it, you know, go do an engagement and close things out. That right. wasn't really enabling our, our ongoing relationship mindset that we really wanted to bring to this. So that's where we started using IU has Salesforce CRM. And we spent a lot of time customizing that so we can take notes about our researchers, who they are, mm -hmm. what kind of research they do, what types of things they've reached out to us on in the past. And it just also oh. happened to have a uh, really good capability for tracking our metrics. So a right. lot of what we do is just um, making sure we can, you know, provide evidence that we really care about this researcher and the work they're doing. And so that's a lot of our internal documentation is just our, our customer relationship management software. As far as the compliance stuff, so our team is responsible uh, for the, the NIST risk management framework on our research technology systems. It, that was a pretty complex system a problem to solve is managing compliance documentation for an institution that has a hundred plus central systems that are, <laughs> that are under it. Essentially what uh, uh, Anurag came up with was there's a uh, central uh, SSP called our Enterprise Common Controls SSP. And so those mm -hmm. are the controls that apply to you no matter where you are in the institution, like how our ADS operates, the security controls that are on our, are on our network and our VPN and that kind of stuff. So it doesn't matter mm -hmm. which system we're taking through the process next, a lot of stuff we can refer back to this Enterprise Common Controls SSP. And then at the individual system level, we just have to say what's separate from that, 
like, oh, this system manages a few local accounts for administrators, but for the rest of that, it uses ADS accounts. So refer back to the enterprise common control document. <laughs> you gave some good golden nuggets there. Absolutely. And another surprise is how many cybersecurity professionals are proficient in Salesforce? <laughs> not, not many, not at yeah. all, but there's so much value in there because to that point, you're collecting historical knowledge. You're able to retain that versus a traditional ticket system where you just kind of basic information. The Salesforce, yeah. you, you're keeping track of all the historical knowledge and then also it does reinforce to the researcher when you work with them again. You, they don't have to repeat the same information and tell you the same things. You already know it. Then, yep. like, okay, you're, you're paying attention to me and it's building that rapport and that yep. relationship. Wow. Okay. It's good, good nuggets there, though. <laughs> we'll really appreciate it uh, since you've been in, embarking on this journey. What are some key takeaways or lessons learned that you want to share with the, mm -hmm. with the research community? You've already shared a lot, but yeah, just making sure if anything else, I'm trying to get it all out of you. <laughs> One of the things that I've always thought we've gone and presented about Secure My Research, about our white paper you know, saying this is a solution that can apply to any institution. And a lot of times, even, you know, I could see an organization. About anybody picking this up and just having a person focused cybersecurity approach and it being successful. But when we went and presented about this, a lot of times institutions would say like, we're too fragmented or we're too under-resourced or we don't have that big catalog of, of systems available. Right. And what I've always thought and said to these folks is, I, I understand that, so and I understand how that could impact, like you maybe not having a Secure My Research that is as broadly successful and widely impactful as ours, but if you just give researchers a person to talk to that can understand the policies for them, have an idea of what solutions are out there, whether it's a lot or not, and can understand mm -hmm. some of these best practices and what a compliance regime might be looking for. Just having a person that's saying, I can, I can help you. I can take this burden of understanding all this cybersecurity stuff off your shoulders, whether that's like, you know, a multiple person team or just one person, even part-time, just having that right. person available is going to accelerate research and reduce risk to your research mission. Yep. And then it's going to spread, like I said, a word of mouth. So, <laughs> and then with yeah. success, you know, then you can show your administration that it's worth throwing some more funding, effort, and time into. I don't know how you can rebut that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, who, 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 what researcher wouldn't say yes to that for yeah. the position that way? So that, that's fantastic. The question I always like to ask, I guess, is what do you know now that you wish you knew earlier in your career? Yeah. So when I was starting out in cybersecurity, so I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a situation where college right out of high school just wasn't in the picture for me financially. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just had uh, ended up with an associate's degree from Ivy Tech, a community college in Indiana. And I was always afraid just to kind of dive in because I was always, you know, worried that there's people that might know this cybersecurity stuff better <laughs> than me. And I landed in CACR and man, the imposter syndrome was real because there are some real geniuses. Brilliant people. And it, yeah. Yeah, it, it hurts. It's really, first off, don't be scared. Second off, hone in on what you feel makes you special and what makes you feel successful. For me, that's helping people out. Like I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but if you need something, I got your back. And just really turning that into what you hone in on to make you successful. That's what I've done in my role as CISO within CACR. And like I said, even though I'm not the most cybersecurity and technical, technically proficient person in the CACR, my program as a CISO has been very successful because people know they can reach out to me anytime and get help. So yeah, it's yeah. Just, don't be scared, really hone in on what makes you successful. That's great. If you don't know the answers, I'm sure you know how to find the answers. So that's the key, <laughs> where to yeah. get them. Yeah. And I, I can relate to that imposter syndrome. I started my cybersecurity career in the army and it's going to be very intimidating and it's always going to be people smarter than you. But I love that where you hone in on what you're good at, what sets you apart and just will it really cultivate that and become known for that. It's good stuff. I'm curious. You have some nice guitars on your wall. Do you play? Yep. Yeah, I play. I play guitar. Uh -huh. It's funny. That's uh, that's one of the <laughs> questions that people always ask when I'm doing is like, do you play those guitars? And they go for decoration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, quite a bit. Wow. 
Oh, so, yeah, I used to have a guitar on my wall, but it was just decoration. I got it from <laughs> like, so no, that was looked too fancy to just be decoration. That's, that's cool. All right, Will, well, I really appreciate your time today. And wow, I'm, I was really impressed by everything you shared with your latest secure my research and everything y'all are doing at IU. Like, y'all are certainly on to something and I'm going to do my part, try to get the word out as much as I can. I know you to be an uh, uh, advocate of what y'all are doing. I, I, I believe in it. It's impressive. And I see why um, your manager's name keeps coming up on yeah. all these interview podcasts. Yeah, the word's getting out, so certainly keep it up. Yeah. Great things. Um, before I let you go, um, I want to ask, what is a book, movie, podcast, or something that's had a profound impact on your, on your life, professionally or in personally? Um, there's a book that really highlighted for me is when I was new to the CACR and, you know, one of those senior people I really looked it up to kind of brought me into a training thing that they were doing. And it was a book about how to be successful among a lot of different competitors. And it was that mm -hmm. idea of find what makes you special in your sector. I mean, even as a business and as a professional mm -hmm. and really right. hone in on that. And it was rec some recommendations on that. And reading that book really let me let start letting go of of that fear and just being like mm -hmm. okay i'll just focus on being really good at being the guy people go to so that books like planted the seed and then as i got that feedback like man that was you've been super helpful uh you're a great CISO because you make yourself available to everybody and it's a, a like a service focused cybersecurity program and you know mm -hmm. that just led me to know i was being successful at focusing on what makes me stand out so that's the book. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Certainly send it to me when you find the title. I'll add it in the show notes and also with the white paper, any other information you want to share in, in the show notes. But this has been a fantastic value packed interview. Will I'm really happy we had a chance to talk today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Thanks for having me. If you receive value from this episode, I invite you to subscribe and like so that you're the first to know when we release new episodes. Also, check out cmmcproof.com to learn more about the arsenal of resources that we provide to equip you to conquer CMMC. We'll see you next time.